Hello everyone and welcome to this new episode of Tech Pizza. I guess you noticed that we're trying a different setup where I'm closer, it's a bit more personal I guess. Let me know if you like it down in the comments. So this week there's a lot of very interesting news. We're gonna talk about crazy stuff happening in AI, in startups and in crypto. But before we get started I want to tell you the results of the poll that we did last week. Last week we tried this new experiment where basically when we talked about one specific news, Amazon buying iRobot, I asked the receivers of the newsletter what they thought about the motivations behind this piece of news. I asked if they thought if Amazon bought it because they wanted to steal data about people's houses or if they did that because they were just interesting in expanding their business in the home automation sector. Now, the answers were half and half, basically. 56% of the newsletter subscribers thought that this was a move to try to get more data, and 44 thought that this was just a business move. Now, I'm gonna make a poll on this edition as well, and I want you to vote. If you're not subscribed to Tech Pizza, you should do that. You go on tech.pizza, you get an email every Thursday, and you can vote straight from the email. Otherwise, just go on tech.pizza. You're gonna find the poll in the link to the latest news. That being said, let's get started because there's a lot of juicy things to talk about this week. <laughs> If you follow Tech Pizza already, you know we talked often about these new kind of AI algorithms that allow you to draw anything that you want. These are algorithms like DAL E2 or like Mid Journey. You type anything like an Italian astronaut enjoying pizza on the moon, and bam, you get instantly a super cool image drawn by AI. You can also try to do more crazy stuff, like you can ask it to imagine the life before the Big Bang, for instance, and you get super cool images like this. Now, the companies behind these algorithms like OpenAI and MidJourney have always been cautious. They try to put filters in place so that people were not able to reproduce, let's say, pornographic images, violent images, or even images of famous people. You know why, I don't have to explain explain you what's going on. I mean, imagine if people are capable just by typing into something to get whatever image they want. Misinformation would be pretty bad. But now there's a new company called Stability AI that is launching a new product called Stable Diffusion. And what makes this company unique is they basically don't care about ethics, I guess. They basically put very limited restrictions to what you can do with their algorithm. You can try to do anything, and people already made some experiments. They tried to reproduce pictures of Obama, and it looked like this, pretty accurate. They made pictures of Boris Johnson holding different kinds of objects, and it looked pretty good. They also tried to reproduce images of the war in Ukraine, and they looked pretty legit. Also tried to make more pornographic and sexual images, but I'm not gonna post these ones right here, you naughty boys and girls. If you wanna watch them, I guess you have to look for yourself. What do you think about this? This is making me think about a phenomenon that I've... it's been in my head for a while. I call it the AI genie effect. So imagine the AI is like a genie. When it gets out of its bottle, you cannot put it back in. What do I mean? Once OpenAI and MidJourney and Google and Facebook developed these technologies and they explained to the world how these technologies worked, it's impossible to put these technologies back into the genie. They're out in the world, people know how they work, and they can just reproduce the technology doing whatever the hell they want to do. So even if OpenAI and Google and MidJourney were really careful with making sure this technology was used safely, then somebody else is just going to copy that, and if they don't have the same moral standards of these companies, they're just going to do whatever they want. This is a big issue, because the only way in my head to prevent these things from happening is if there's a regulation coming from above that can stop this kind of very unethical applications. Now, the problem is that technology evolves super fast. Literally, all this stuff was impossible like three, four months ago, and now it's everywhere. So I really don't see the solution. I don't think the lawmakers and policymakers can keep up with this. Of course, the only way that we can have a chance if, is if they study, actually, if they try to keep up and try to, you know, jump into the conversation as it evolves. But I don't see that happening. Let me know what you think. This guy right here is Adam Neumann, the founder of WeWork. He revolutionized the second biggest asset class in the world, which is office real estate. And he did that by founding WeWork. Now, he has a very controversial character for a bunch of different reasons. First of all, the mission of the company, in his own words, was to elevate the world's consciousness. 
Like he was actually just basically renting office space with kombucha on top. Sounds a little bit too much, isn't it? But he also basically raised money at insane evaluations up to $46 billion. And his company now has a market cap of $4 billion, basically less than a tenth of what he promised investors, which means that basically all his investors didn't make any money, but he is a billionaire. He managed to buy private jets and lots of crazy stuff with the company's money. And even afterwards, he, he still had a lot of shares that were valued a lot of money while all the investors lost everything. Now, after you know about this, and by the way, uh, I'm watching a series about him called We Crashed on Apple TV. Really, really good. Watch it so you're going to understand a little bit more about this crazy character. But after you know these few things that I told you, would you give him your money? Apparently, Andriy Sonorowicz, which is one of the most successful venture capitalists in the world, decided that that was a good idea. And they signed the biggest check ever in their history, $350 million, to fund his new startup, which is called Flow. Flow is roughly in the same industry, it's in real estate, but it's trying to disrupt residential real estate, basically your home. Now, the interesting thing is that the arguments that Andriy Sonorowicz pushed forward actually make a lot of sense. And I can say that because I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm the chairman of a co-living space in Copenhagen called Nest. And so I'm, I'm familiar with these concepts and I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, let me tell you the five different points that uh, Andres Norwitz tried to push forward to justify this investment. First of all, they said that the one of the models, there's basically two models to have property. One is you buy it and this seems to be not feasible anymore for a lot of people because the cost of real estate skyrocketed, cutting off a lot of people from this option of owning their own home. And that's the first problem that this company may solve. Second problem is that the alternative is to rent. But renting, first of all, you don't build any equity. It's just cash that goes out of the window, but also can be a pretty lonely experience because you, you're not going to be incentivized to invest in a place if you know that you don't own it and you may just move and go somewhere else in a different city, or even the same city, but another area. It doesn't facilitate the creation of communities. The third problem is that now, after COVID, a lot of people work remotely, which means that they moved away from their hometown and they're pushed to live in areas where maybe they're not that developed. Maybe they wanna just move around, they don't wanna stay in the same place for a while. So the traditional methods of owning houses or renting an apartment just don't make much sense anymore. Fourth problem. It seems like there's a shift in priorities for people. The great resignation means that a lot of people try to value different things other than career. And so if you don't value career anymore, well, then it doesn't make sense to live in a big city, doesn't it? And reason number five, and then I'm done. Well, Adam Neumann, he may be a very controversial figure, but we have to say he did disrupt single-handedly an industry. So he may just do it again. So these are all the motivations that Andres Norris pushed forward to justify their investment. Now, I personally am very puzzled. I see the point. I see that Adam Neumann is probably the person to pull off a revolution in this industry, but he's very controversial. So I don't know if this is going to work, but I want to know what you think. I'm going to make a new poll. This is going to be the poll of the week. Do you think that Adam Neumann is going to succeed? Or do you think that it's not a great idea and he's probably going to end up spending all the money of its investors and all the time? Let me know. Go on Tech Top Pizza, click on the latest edition and vote. And next week, I'm going to tell you the results. We are getting closer and closer to one of the most important events in the history of crypto. It's called The Merge. And it's an event where Ethereum is going to move from proof of work to proof of stake. Now, what the hell does it mean? I'm going to try to explain it in a very simple way. But you can be assured, I'm going to talk about this much more because this is an historic event. So it's going to be covered much more in this video series, in the podcast, and just bear with me. I'm going to talk about it more. The simple version is that Ethereum, as every other blockchain, needs to have a consensus mechanism to add blocks. Blocks is basically just data that represent transactions to a chain of blocks. Now, the way that Ethereum and Bitcoin work is through a system called proof of work. Basically, I guess you heard about miners, these people that have these giant computers and giant server rooms that are mining Bitcoin or mining Ethereum. What they are doing really is that they are doing work, they're solving mathematical problems, spending energy to gain the right to add these blocks to the blockchain. If they do that, they get rewarded with tokens, with some Ethereum or with some 
Bitcoin. Now, this is, of course, a very inefficient method. It works, it does serve the purpose of decentralization, but it's very inefficient. And to give you an idea, Ethereum consumes as much energy as the Netherlands. And one single Ethereum transaction can be the amount of energy that an American family consumes during a week. So it's quite a lot of energy, okay? Now, there's a lot of crypto people that say that, yeah, sure, but it's green energy, but let's just not talk about this, okay? Let's just say it's a lot of energy. It could be reduced. So what Ethereum wants to do, and has been trying to do this for six years, is to move from proof of work to proof of stake. In proof of stake, validators don't need to do any mathematical calculation to add new blocks to the blockchain. All they need to do is stake Ethereum. So they need to prove that they have a bunch of Ethereum sitting somewhere, and that's gonna be what they need to gain the right to add blocks to the blockchain and get rewarded. This new mechanism is gonna make Ethereum much more efficient. The energy consumption is gonna drop by 99.9%. .9%, basically gonna be nothing, okay? But also, the bandwidth, the amount of transaction that Ethereum can support is gonna increase a lot. Today, Ethereum can manage an average of 15 transactions per second, which is nothing if you think about it. And thanks to this merge, they can get up to 100,000 transactions per second, which is pretty great, right? So everybody is excited, but there's a little problem, and this is pretty complex and hard to understand, but I'll give you just the gist of it, and I'm gonna talk about it again, I promise. The problem is, this merge is gonna create two copies of the same blockchain. One is gonna be the old one, using proof of work, and one is gonna be the new one, using proof of stake. Everything that ever happened on the Ethereum blockchain is gonna be doubled. Now, the issue is, all these assets that have been built on the blockchain, they need to choose what to keep you know, working on. They also can do both. But ideally, people need to just forget about the proof of work, old energy consuming stuff, and all move the new proof of stake protocol. But Ethereum can't force people to do so. So now, this week, there have been an announcement from Circle. Circle is the company behind USDC, which is the second biggest stablecoin in the world, with a $53 billion market cap as of today that I'm shooting the video. Basically, what's happening to them is that they have a bunch of tokens, and they're backed that's what they say, by real dollars, one-to-one. -one. If you double the tokens, the dollars don't get doubled, obviously. So they needed to pick, they need to decide which one is going to be their official version of the blockchain. And they decided, thank God, to support the proof-of-stake version, the new one, the most efficient one. But the question still holds, what if um, one of these projects says, you know what, I like the proof-of-work version, I'm going to stick to that one, that's what I want to use. It's, it's, it's a big risk, and there are very strong incentives from certain groups of people to push for proof of work to keep existing. The main one is that you basically don't make any money with proof of stake. You make a lot of money before. Imagine these people that spent lots of money building these giant mining rigs in the middle of the freaking Russia or whatever to make all those money by mining, they suddenly uh, can't do it anymore. It suddenly makes no sense whatsoever to have all these investments. So these people, they have incentives to keep the old protocol going. What's gonna happen? I don't know. I, I guess nobody knows. But this is a very controversial topic, and as word to God, I'm going to talk about it much more if you find this interesting, of course. So let me know in the comments if this was clear, if you have questions, I'm going to try to answer, and what else do you want to know? Because I'm going to talk about it much more. Okay? Let me know in the comments. <laughs>Thank you for watching this episode of Tech Pizza. Let me know if you liked it with this new setup and these different graphics, and I hope this is better. Let me know in the comments, really. I really like to answer everybody of you. Now, if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, I highly recommend you do that. First of all, because you get in your inbox every Thursday a text description of all the news, videos, podcasts, and everything. But also because I'm doing these polls, I'm doing these interactive questions where I ask people what they think about a piece of news, I get data, and then I just talk about it the next week, so you get a chance to vote. Go on Tech Top Pizza and subscribe. I'm gonna see you next week. Ciao.